Hey, thanks for checking out Next Level Carpentry today. So I can explain why I say no to stubby shims and how I make mine with feather fine ends. Most purchase shims have stubby ends on them. You've all seen them and those are fine for general carpentry work and a lot of window and door installation jobs. But as most of you know, I'm a pretty fussy guy. Like a professional chef demanding choice ingredients for his signature dishes, I prefer my shims to have specific properties. First off, they have to have feather thin points on them like this. This allows me to make very small precise adjustments for things like cabinet installations because the thin tapered ends start out at a sixteenth of an inch or less. I want my shims to be smooth and relatively not free to slide and adjust smoothly and not break easily in use. And I want shims to have straight consistent grain so they cut and snap easily. They need to be fast and easy to make, to be practical to use without hesitation from concern for cost. Most importantly, I need to make these quickly and safely. After all, there's no shim in the world that's worth the risk of injury or a trip to the ER, right? And I think the only OSHA approved shim cutting fixture is the one that's used in the shim making factory. But I don't like the shims that they make. So I'll show you how I do this potentially dangerous operation quickly and safely and well within my comfort zone for safe practices. But I need to say if you choose to make your own shims, you do so at your own risk. To make the fixture I use for cutting shims, I use a quarter inch MDF. This is melamine coated, but veneer coated would work equally well. This piece is 10 inches by 16 inches and I want to lay it out for the shims I'm cutting which are going to be 12 inches long. So just start at the end of the sheet and mark 12 inches. And at 12 inches long, I want them to be 5 sixteenths of an inch thick, which is right there. And I need to notch the edge of this melamine so that all the shims come out precisely the same. So I'm going to flush up this ruler here at the end, swing it till I hit that little cross mark at 12 inches and 15 or 5 sixteenths. Draw a line, just like that, and I'll square it at the 12 inch mark. So this is the exact size of my shims here and I need to cut that out quite accurately. Other shim cutting videos on YouTube generally use a bandsaw to cut out the notch to the shape of the shim, but I don't like that because a bandsaw cut's going to be a little bit wavy. So I'll show you a quicker, more accurate way to do that. I start out with another piece of quarter inch material that's wider than my fixture. This piece is extra wide, but anything even just a little bit wider is good. I trim off this auxiliary fence piece in a table saw to make sure both edges are perfectly parallel. And then I leave the rip fence at the setting I just used. This width is arbitrary, but in this case it happens to be 17 and a quarter inches. Now I use a couple of half inch long brads and set them with this magnetic tack hammer. And all I have to do is line up the edge of this overlay piece perfectly with the pencil mark on the fixture and tack it in place. like that. Then I take the fixture with this auxiliary fence on it back to the table saw. I've raised the blade so I can cut closer to the spot where I'll cut the heel out by hand. And using the same rip fence setting, cut out the long edge of the wedge, stopping just short of where the heel is going to be for holding the shim. And I'll cut that little bit out by hand. And I think you'll admit that would be tough to beat for speed or accuracy. Now I just need to notch out this heel by hand. So I'll separate the two pieces with a putty knife and then clamp it in a vise where I can make quick work of that notch with a small pull saw. Just like that. With the shim notch cut out, I need to add a strip of this maple stock that's sized to fit my miter slot to the underside of the jig to guide it during use. This piece needs to be perfectly parallel to the long edges of the fixture. So I'll show you how I set that up. 
I made this fixture piece exactly 10 inches wide on purpose. So I've set the rip fence to 10 inches so that it just skims the teeth of the blade. Then I'll drop this maple strip in. You can see how this fits in this miter slot. It's flush with the top of the saw uh, and it doesn't wiggle but it slides smoothly. A bit of Starbond CA glue is the quickest way I know to get these two pieces lined up and stuck together. And make note that this miter slot bar is slightly longer than the fixture on both ends. And it goes about here. So I'm just going to spritz the back side of this melamine with the Starbond accelerator. Right along that pencil line. Then I'll use their medium CA glue. Just put some dabs on here to hold everything in place. Now I just drop this piece on here, holding it tight to the fence and pressing it down firmly to that miter slot bar. And I can hold it for a few seconds till the glue reacts and tap it loose because I got a little overzealous with that CA glue. Once the guide bar is lined up and stuck to this melamine board, I can flip it over and then use this small snappy bit to pile it and countersink for screws to hold the pieces together. I recently got these carbide tipped snappy bits to replace the old high speed steel ones I've had for many years and these things are amazing. They've got a different drill bit design that cuts really fast and efficiently and that cardboard is razor sharp and gets right into this melamine. And now I can use a few half inch by number six countersunk head fillet screws to hold this together forever and always. I got my snappy countersink holes too deep. I got a little overzealous with that. But these screws didn't come out the bottom. The reason I add screws to this is because CA glue and melamine are pretty brittle and if I bump the fixture while I'm using it, it could easily knock that guide bar off. But with the glue and the screws, that thing's there for good. I'll use a sharp putty knife to clean up the little extra glue that's squeezed out and make sure the screw heads aren't sticking out the bottom of this maple. So it'll slide nicely in that miter slot. And now this fixture can be used either with or without the rip fence for cutting consistently precise shims as long as I feel like doing it. To make my uh, shim cutting fixture a little more user friendly, I want to put a handle on it. I see some YouTube channels where a block of wood gets screwed on to the fixture somehow, but this is next level carpentry, so we're going to do a little better than that. Basically what I'm doing is taking one of my favorite push sticks. Uh, there's a link to a video to show how to make these, but I just take a modified one of these with the heel cut off. Looks like this and I want to attach it to the fixture so that I can use it with my fingers uh, as far from the blade as possible. And this is how I do that. I want this handle about two inches from the back and centered up on this piece. So I can just mark it out. Ten inches wide, five, four and five-eighths to five and three-eighths will be centered. like that. I also added a center mark at five inches so I can drill a few holes in there. This part's pretty familiar so if you're paying attention you can just skip this. Put a little activator on the bottom of the handle. A few dabs of glue here. Just line up the handle with my pencil marks and press it in place till the glue cures, which takes just a few seconds. Like that. Now I can just chase those holes through with that snappy countersink bit. And here I'll use number seven by three quarter inch countersunk Phillips screws to hold the handle to the fixture. 
I make sure that those countersinks are deep enough so that the screw heads are recessed and don't scratch my table saw table. And this middle one's a little bit shallow, so I'll back it out, deepen the countersink, and redrive it. And that is good to go. Once I've got a sturdy handle attached, the notch cut, and the guide bar in place, I could actually start cutting shims with this fixture just by putting a block of wood in here and cutting them off. But when I go into uh, shim production mode, I'm going to make literally hundreds of shims. And I want to add some safety measures so that I can cut these uh, shims quickly and efficiently without getting my fingers too close when this piece gets small. And I don't want to throw away the small piece uh, because of what I've invested in this piece of clear cedar wood. So I'll show you the safety measures that I add next. The first safety measure I want to add is going to be a sort of an auxiliary fence to help support the edge of the shims as they're cut off. So I'm just taking a straight edge block of 2 by and I'll scribe it so that it matches the height of the shim stock I'm making for this batch of shims. And I'll rip that block off on the table saw. And then I'll attach the block to the fixture with the end of the block exactly lined up with the heel of the shim, like that. Third verse, same as the first two. Next, I want to attach this small piece of half-inch Russian birch plywood to the end of that fence to act as a stop block for pushing the shim through. And all my extensions are out on a job site, so I've got this ridiculous setup to run a snappy bit in the end. So that I can use a two inch square drive screw to hold that stop block in place. Something like that. So you can see how that auxiliary fence and this little stop block will help guide the workpiece pass the blade more safely and keep my hands away from that spinning finger amputation device. But since I want to get shims out of this entire width of the block, at some point that's going to be a pretty small workpiece and I don't want my fingers in here close to the blade. So I'll add one more safety measure which is kind of a hold down block that attaches to this fence and extends out over the workpiece. I used a three-quarter inch Forstner bit and a one inch Corbox bit in drill press to put nice finger indents in the working end of my little hold down block. That would have been a little smoother if I clamped that block down, but this will work fine. Then I just position this hold down block, oh let's say two and a half inches from the end. Use a snappy bit to countersink a couple holes and drive in a couple of inch and a half square drive screws to hold that hold down block in place. And now a little finger pressure out here will keep the jig working safely, efficiently, and smoothly. So the last thing I need to do before going into full shim production mode is to swap out a thin kerf blade for an ultra thin kerf blade specifically dedicated for cutting shims. I'm using this Bosch 24 tooth 7 and a quarter inch skill saw blade which is ultra thin kerf and great for ripping wood like this with a minimum of waste. This blade happens to have a 5 8 inch arbor, which is exactly what is standard on my Delta Unisaw. And last but not least, I'll switch out the zero clearance insert to one that matches this skinny, skinny Bosch blade. And set the blade height so that it'll cut through the shim like that. The first pass past the blade will trim the end of this block ever so slightly, put a small cut in the underside of this hold down block and trim off this uh, stop block here so it's all custom sized to making these specific shims. And now I'm all set for a test drive of this 12 inch long, nothing to 5 16 over 12 inch shim cutting fixture. I flip the block over after each shim is cut to keep the workpiece relatively rectangular so that the shims come out straight grained instead of cross grained.
partway through the process, the jig started to get a little sticky running over the table saw. So I took uh, Johnson's paste wax in a rag and wiped down the bottom of the jig and the runner with a liberal coat of paste wax that helps it slide real smooth through the table saw. But then when it's sliding smoother, I'm using extra caution because I don't wanna have a slip and an accident. Grease lightning. So I think you can see how with a uh, well-designed fixture with built-in safety and convenience features, I'm able to quickly cut identical shims. Uh, there's 50 of them here. They came out of one uh, two by 12, 12 inches long. Every shim has a feather thin end on one end for precise work and they're 5 16 on the other end. They wrap up in bundles so that I can store them and take them to the job site until next time I get into shim cutting mode. When Chip heard that I made a new shim cutting fixture and had a whole stack of cedar blocks that I needed cut up into shims, he jumped right in and started sawing. He's been at it a while and he's got a ways to go, but I really appreciate all the work he's doing. While he's sawing away over there, I want to thank everyone for watching the video and ask that you consider subscribing to Next Level Carpentry if you haven't already. While you're at it, give that thumbs up button to poke and let YouTube know you like what you see here on this channel. While that pile of shims is growing, it'll end up at right at 400 shims from that stack of cedar. Most times I'll use just random scraps of wood from the job site, uh, but this time for the video, I wanted to have a good stack to do all at the same time, so I went that route. It's been a few years since I made a pile of shims, so this batch of 400 will last me for a couple of years, but I wanted to get them made for the upcoming project I'm uh, doing this winter, and starting off on that project, I need a bunch of these shims, and when I get some videos produced from that job, you'll see why and how. I made a complete list of the tools and supplies I used in this video for making that jig, and I included them in the video description below, so you can check those out. And I gave Jeff Bezos at Amazon a call, and he said anything you buy through those links will be the same low online cost you're used to, but he'll help support Next Level Carpentry by sending just a teeny fraction of his trillions of dollars of profit to this channel for ad fees. So I really appreciate it. I appreciate everyone who's joined the group at Patreon, becoming a patron and pledging to support the channel. It helps offset the costs involved in producing videos like this that you can watch for free and offset income I'm not making out on a job site, which is what I'd be doing if I wasn't shooting videos. So that's really helpful. And anyone that's interested in uh, becoming a patron, there's a link to Patreon below, and it would be great. T-shirts like the ones Chip and I are wearing are available at Teespring. If you're interested in that, or maybe a Next Level Carpentry logo mug for your desk or shop, links to that are below also. Well, Chip's really getting after it, and he'd be making a pile of sawdust if it wasn't for the dust processor running over there. But he's going to be through that stack before too long. So, until next time, and as always, thanks for watching. Yo, Chip, pile's looking good. You want to, like, take a break over there? He's not listening. Chip! Yo, Chip! Want to cut it off? Call it a day? No? You're good? He's not going to stop till he's done. And we got things to do, so catch you later. Three ninety six, three ninety seven, three ninety eight, three ninety nine, four hundred. Woohoo! That's it, four hundred sh shims. Hey, I'm done cutting shims. Where'd everybody go? Hello? Hey, Matt, where'd you go? Dude!